Sri Aurobindo has been evoking for us the experience that comes to Savitri with the complete silencing of her whole being. So when everything falls silent, there's a sense of the unreality of all the appearances of the world. No? And yet she feels that beyond all these appearances, there is a reality. No? And yet that reality can't be grasped by the senses or by thought or in any way. It's a spaceless and a placeless infinite. And, but those seem to be just like words, yet eternity and infinity seemed but words, vainly affixed, stuck onto the mind in its incompetence to grasp that. It puts these words, it says, eternity, infinity, on that stupendous, long, reality. That is the only thing that is real. All the appearances of the world, they look like shadows, things that have no substance and no meaning. So I'm going to read on from there. Speaking about that stupendous lone reality, Sri Aurobindo says, the world is but a spark burst from its light. All moments flashes from its timelessness. All objects, glimmerings of the bodiless that disappear from mind when that is seen. It held as if a shield before its face, a consciousness that saw without a seer the truth where knowledge is not nor knower, nor known. The love, enamored of its own delight, in which the lover is not, nor the beloved, bringing their personal passion into the vast. The force, omnipotent in quietude, the bliss that none can ever hope to taste. It cancelled the convincing cheat of self, a truth in nothingness was its mighty clue. If all existence could renounce to be, and being take refuge in non-being's arms, and non-being could strike out its ciphered round, some luster of that reality might appear. A formless liberation came on her. Once sepulchred alive in brain and flesh, she had risen up from body, mind and life. She was no more a person in a world. She had escaped into infinity. What once had been herself had disappeared. 
There was no frame of things, no figure of soul. A refugee from the domain of sense, evading the necessity of thought, delivered from knowledge and from ignorance, and rescued from the true and the untrue. She shared the superconscious high retreat beyond the self-born word, the nude idea, the first bare solid ground of consciousness. Beings were not there. Existence had no place. There was no temptation of the joy to be. Unutterably effaced. No one and null. A vanishing vestige like a violet trace. A faint record merely of a self now past. She was a point in the unknowable. I'll stop there. Done it, Rosa. <clears throat> the world is but a spark burst from its light. All moments flash from its timelessness. All objects glimmerings of their bodies that disappear from mind when that is seen. Yes. So this is speaking about that stupendous lone reality, that spaceless and placeless infinite. This is describing an experience. Hmm? And in that experience, the whole world seems to be just a little spark that has flashed out from the light of that stupendous lone reality. And if we have time here, all our moments are just flashes coming out of that timelessness. All these objects that are around Savitri experiences them as faint lights, glimmerings. To glimmer is to glow faintly. You know? So all the things around, they seem like glimmerings of that reality which is bodiless. It does not have any form or shape or limit at all. So all these things, the world, the moments, the objects, they all disappear from the mind when the mind becomes aware of that reality. Hmm? It tells as if a shield before its face the consciousness that saw the God of the seal, the truth, where knowledge is not, nor known, nor known, the love in animal of its own divine, in which the lover is not, nor the beloved, bringing their personal passion into the vast, the force omnipotent in quietude.
the bliss that none can ever hope to taste. Yes. It's as if that lone reality is holding a kind of mask in front of its face. And that mask takes the appearance of a consciousness in which there's no one seeing. There's just a consciousness that's seeing, that's aware. Hmm? There's a truth, a truth where there's no knower and there's no knowledge, and there's nothing known, there's just that truth. Hmm? But this is, this is like a kind of shield that it puts in front of itself. It doesn't show itself. It only gives this sense that this is the only reality. This consciousness in which there's no, nobody being conscious. There's no seer. No. There's a truth, but nobody is knowing that truth. There's a love, a love which is completely satisfied with its own delight, enamored, it's in love with its own delight. And there's no one loving, there's no lover there, and there was no one being loved. Those would, the, if there were a lover and a beloved, that would be bringing something personal, and a personal passion, a personal relationship, bringing that into this vast limitlessness. No, there's nothing like that. There's a consciousness, there's a truth, there's a love, there's a force, an omnipotent force, but it doesn't move. It's absolutely still and silent. All-powerful, omnipotent in quietude. And there is a bliss, a state of beatitude that no one can ever hope to taste, to experience. This is not Satchitanda. This hmm? is not Satchitanda. This is, this is ana the, uh, that Ananda, but it's beyond the personal. Hmm? It's a vast, impersonal, and it's only, it's only a, a projection or an expression of that which is behind. We, we, she, she becomes aware of it as a bliss that nobody can ever hope to experience, but that's not what it is. No, it itself is something beyond that. Hmm? Yes, it has some connection. Do you want me to explain that connection now? This is in book three, this line which um, uh, Bhuvana has just quoted. The first canto of uh, book three is called The Pursuit of the Unknowable. And in a way what uh, Savitri is experiencing now is that unknowable. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very liberating experience for Aswapati and uh, as it is becoming for, for Savitri also. We will read about her liberation you know, from all sense of person, as if this limited personality no longer exists at all. You know. But in Canto 2, this line which you just read, then Aswapati is told that is a very, very powerful, liberating experience. But it's not the whole truth. There's another experience beyond. That is, uh, what's the line before? Oh, now you've lost it. <laughs> 
happen. But who, before that, before who has seen the body of the Lord? The black veil has been lifted. We have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient Lord. Mm. But who has lifted up the veil of life? Mm. Who, has who has seen? Yes, who has, who has seen? We may have had this glimpse you know, of that reality, but there's something else. And that uh, something else is will will be what we will read about in the last canto, in canto seven. Yeah. It's as if he's, uh, the poet is just is a little teased with this light that none can ever hope to taste. So what your explanation is that she perceives it. She perceives this kind of projection, but it's something unknowable, unattainable, ungraspable. None can ever hope to taste it. Mm. That's her. her experience. Her experience. Yeah. And this unknowable reality then, it's described in the next sentence, uh, what its effect, uh, Bhuvana. It cancels the convincing cheat of blood cell. A true in nothingness was its mighty truth. If all existence could renounce to be, and being take refuge in non being's form, and non being could strike out its cycle wrong, some lustre of that reality might appear. Mm. So it, that reality, cancelled out the convincing cheat of self. We all of us feel that we exist. You know? Even if we don't feel anything else, we feel, oh well I'm here, I'm feeling, I'm perceiving, I'm thinking, so I exist. But he says that's just a convincing cheat. None of us really exist, at least not in that way. Mm -hmm. So this experience of the complete silencing, clearing of the mind and consequently the whole being, it gives that sense of the unreality, not only of world, but of self. A truth in nothingness was its mighty clue. The clue is that Something that leads you to, a, to something, to a realization or an understanding. So, that in nothingness there's a truth. Hmm? And then he tries to explain it in ways that we can, that can prompt some experience in us. If all existence, all existence, even the supreme existence, could renounce to be, could give up existing. Yeah? And what we think of as being could take refuge in non-being's arms. There's Sat, the supreme existence, but there's also something like Asat, not being. Yeah? So if that being, that existence, could uh, merge into non-being, take refuge in its arms, and then even the non-being could cross itself out, no? could strike out its ciphered round, its empty circle. No, even this doesn't exist. There's no sat, there's no asat. Some luster, some light of that reality could appear. Might appear, might appear. Thank you. Patricia, here again. A formless liberation. Once sepulchred alive in brain and flesh, she had risen up from
her body, mind, and heart. She was no more a person in the world. She had escaped into infinity. Yes. So this is the formless liberation. The liberation, the dissolution of all form, all, and form implies limits, outlines. Liberation means being set free. So she's set free from this illusion of a being a separate person. And once it says she had been sepulchred in mind, in brain and flesh. A sepulchre is a tomb where somebody is buried, where the remains of somebody is. So it was as if she had been contained in this brain and flesh and she hadn't really been alive. She'd been confined in this dead framework. But now, now she has risen up out of that sepulchre. She's risen up out of body, mind and life. And she no longer experiences herself as a person in a world. She's escaped. She's escaped into infinity. So this is one of the great realizations of yoga, mukti, moksha, that spiritual seekers have sought for for millennia. But Sri Aurobindo is telling us this is a very great realization, but it's not the ultimate realization. Beyond that, there's another experience. Would you like to read? What once had been herself had disappeared. <clears throat> there was no frame of things, no figure of soul. Continue. A refugee from the domain of sense, evading the necessity of thought, delivered from knowledge and from ignorance, and rescued from the true and the untrue. She shared the superconscious high retreat beyond the self-born self world, the new idea. The first bare, solid ground of consciousness. So I think we'll pause there. So that feeling of savagery, what once had been herself, had disappeared. And there's no framework, no physical framework of things. There's even no figure of soul, no sense of an individualized soul. She's a refugee. A refugee is a person who runs away from a state that they, <coughs> uh, for, for one reason or another, they need to leave it. No? So what she's escaped from is the domain of sense, of the senses. Everything that, almost everything that we experience is determined by our senses. No? It's how we relate to the world around us. She's escaped from that. Hmm? She's escaped to evade, means also to escape, you know, to run away from something. She's escaped from the necessity of thought. There's no need for her to think. There's no need for her to uh, interpret the data which the senses give, there's no need for her to interpret the world around her. She's been delivered. And this is another um, word like liberate. She's been set free from this duality of knowledge and ignorance. We feel that we know certain things. There are other things that we don't know. So in one respect we may have some knowledge, but uh, in other respects there's the ignorance. And these are two fundamentally different ways of experiencing the world. 
with knowledge, capital K, knowing the reality of the world and not knowing it. No. She's rescued from the duality of there being something true and what is not true. There's this opposition. Instead, she's really reached the, the, uh, the state of superconscience, the transcendent state. She shared the superconscience high retreat, uh, a plane which is beyond the self-born word and beyond the nude idea. She's come into a state of pure consciousness, which is not um, not projecting itself in any way. The word, the capital, the word with a capital W, it's the creative word from which things get manifested. No? But she's in a state above that, before that, we could say, beyond that, beyond the pure, nude, naked idea, which again is creative, which gives rise to forms and movements and forces. So this is in a transcendent state before any manifestation. She's experiencing the first bare ground of consciousness, pure consciousness. <coughs> Sergei. Beings dwell out their existence at our place. There was no temptation for the world to be. An utterly great face, no one, and now, a vanishing hostage, like a violent trance, a faint record merely of a self now past. She was a boy in the unknown. So it's, we, we think, when we think of Satchit Ananda, we think of existence, consciousness and Ananda being one. But there are planes in which one or another of these states predominate. So she's come into this state of pure consciousness. There's no existence there. There are no beings, no, no existences. And there's no Ananda. There's no temptation of the joy to be. And in that state, she herself feels effaced. This means rubbed out, wiped out. We have the, when we have the class, we have a white board and something's written on it, and you efface it, you wipe it off. It's as if she herself has been effaced in a way that can't be expressed. To utter means to speak out, to express. It's unutterably effaced. Impossible to say how much effaced she is. She's become no one, nothing, null. She doesn't exist. A vanishing vestige, like a violet, trace. A vestige is something that's left after everything has gone. No? There's just a little bit, a trace, a mark of where something was. No? A faint record, just a faint record of a self that's now past, that's now no longer exists. She feels like a faint record, a vestige, something that's left over from a self that's now finished, past, and she feels like a point in that 
unknowable reality. A point has no dimensions. No. Lela, would you read? Only some last annulment now remained. Annihilation's vague, indefinable step. A memory of being still was there and kept her separate from nothingness. She wasn't that, but still it became not that. Yes, so she's a point in the unknowable, no? But something still exists. Now some last annulment now remained. Annihilation, when something completely ceases to exist. And that would be some further vague, indefinable step. At the moment, there's still a memory of having existed, a memory of being still was there. And that memory is keeping her separate from that vast nothingness, that unknowableness. She is in that, she's a point in the unknowable, but she hasn't become that. Yeah. Is it because of the human nature? Well, it's the last remnant of her identity. And we, we will see um, what comes next. Joel. This shadow of herself, so close to not, could be again self's point d'appui to live, return out of the inconceivable and be what some mysterious past might choose. Yes. Well, there's this violet trace, the shadow of herself, it's almost nothing. It could be again a point d'appui, a, a, a point, a, a basis for coming back into existence, hmm? to live again. Hmm? The fact that there's that little trace means that the whole self might come back again. It might return out of this inconceivable state that she is in. And it could be what some mysterious vast might choose. She wouldn't go back to being what she was before. She could become anything which this unknowable vastness would choose for her to be. Hmm? Point d'appui. Uh, what does it mean? It means a place you can press on in order to uh, to move a lever. I think. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you if you want to move something big and heavy, there's a fulcrum. That's what it means. A fulcrum. Uh, Venkat. Even as the unknowable retreat, she may be now, or you become the heart, or if the omnipotent Nijil took a shape, emerge as someone and lead in the way. Hmm. So the, these, all these possibilities are there. It depends on what that unknowable decreed, what it commands, what it says must happen. Hmm? She might be nothing, she might fade away completely. Or she could again become the whole universe. Hmm? Or if that nothingness, that all-powerful nothingness took a shape, then she might uh, come out, emerge as someone, again as a person, and she might even be able to save the world like that. Hmm? Ganga Lakshmi? Even she might learn what the mystic shift of 
Exit. The seeming exit. Exit, sorry. The seeming exit or close and or fall would be a blind, tenuous passage screen from sight. A state, the eclipsing shell of a darkness sun on its secret way to the ineffable. Yes. If the unknowable decrees, she might learn what this mystical cipher, this apparent zero, what it holds, what it contains. It looks like an exit, it looks like a way out of existence. Or it might be, it, uh, the, the other thing it looks like is that it's a dead end, that this is the end, no? a closed end of all. But it might be a blind, tenebrous passage, a kind of tunnel, hidden tunnel, where it's difficult to see, it's shadowy, it's dark, no? This state that she's in now might be like a, he says, a darkened sun makes me think of a black hole. There was no talk of black holes in those days. But I think something like that happens. You know, that the, the, the sun explodes and then it collapses. So it might be something like that. A darkened sun, but it's on its secret way to that ineffable that inexpressible ultimate reality. A bevel. Even now, her splendid green mind came back, out of silence of the mountains, leaning forth from the all wonderful power of sun, all the feeling of the world, the shining mirror of the eternal truth, to show to the one world. Hmm. So even now, you know, her identity, like a sun that's been eclipsed, it might flame back out of that silence and that nullity and appear. Then she would be seen as a gleaming, wonderful, shining portion of that unknowable, all wonderful, no? a power of some all-affirming absolute. What she's been experiencing is this all-negating absolute. But there's not only the eternal no, there's also the eternal yes. Hmm? So if she flamed back like that, she could be a shining mirror of the eternal truth, reflecting back to that one in all, the divine presence immanent in all the forms of the universe, to shine back and show to all that indwelling divinity its manifest face. It could see itself manifested in the appearances. And that would at the same time show to the divine in us, to the souls of man, their deep identity, their oneness. Mm -hmm. Chandra, you read? She might wake, might wake. Quietude. Quietude. Behind the cosmic day and cosmic night, and rest appears in his white eternity. Yes, so that's the other, another alternative. That from this state that she's in, she might wake up and find herself in 
the eternity of God, no? beyond the dualities of the universe, beyond the cosmic day and the cosmic night. And then she could rest appeased, satisfied and at peace in that white, pure eternity of the Lord. Mm. Suresh? But this was now hundred years or more. Uh, Tower in the mystic bottomless blank. Yes, so that possibility mm, of waking up into God's uh, quietude, this it now feels unreal, remote, far away to her. Or else it's just covered up by this mystic, mystic, fathomless blank. That's what she's experiencing, this blankness, which is fathomless. She can't get to the bottom of that. Dana Lakshmi. In infinite nothingness was the ultimate sign, or else the real was the unknowable, the lonely, absolute, negated all. It faced the ignorant world from its solitude and drown with the soul in its everlasting peace. So this is summing up this experience. Either the ultimate sign, the ultimate thing that we can uh, uh, see or experience, infinite nothingness, shunya, yeah. mm -hmm. or else the real, what is real, what really exists, it's the unknowable, what can't be known. What she's experiencing is this lonely absolute which denies the reality of everything. It negated everything. That experience effaces the ignorant world from its solitude. Not identified with the world anymore. The world is wiped out from that loneliness of this lonely absolute. And this drowns the soul in its everlasting peace. So we can understand that this experience has had its very, very powerful appeal. But there's a further step and we'll start reading about that next time. It held as if a shield before its face, a consciousness that saw without a seer, the truth where knowledge is not, nor knower, nor known, the love enamoured of its own delight, in which the lover is not, nor the beloved, bringing their personal passion into the vast. The force omnipotent in quietude, the bliss that none can ever hope to taste. It cancelled the convincing cheat of self, a truth in nothingness was its mighty clue. If all existence could renounce to be, and being 
take refuge in non-being's arms, and non-being could strike out its ciphered round. Some luster of that reality might appear. A formless liberation came on her. Once sepulchred alive in brain and flesh, she had risen up from body, mind and life. She was no more a person in a world. She had escaped into infinity. What once had been herself had disappeared. There was no frame of things, no figure of soul. A refugee from the domain of sense, evading the necessity of thought, Delivered from knowledge and from ignorance, and rescued from the true and the untrue, she shared the superconscious high retreat beyond the self born word, the nude idea, the first bare solid ground of consciousness. Beings were not there. Existence had no place. There was no temptation of the joy to be. Unutterably effaced, no one and null, a vanishing vestige like a violet trace, a faint record merely of a self now past. She was a point in the unknowable. Only some last annulment now remained, annihilation's vague, indefinable step. A memory of being still was there and kept her separate from nothingness. She was in that but still became not that. This shadow of herself, so close to naught, could be again self's point d'appui to live, return out of the inconceivable, and be what some mysterious vast might choose. Even as the unknowable decreed, she might be naught, or new become the all. Or if the omnipotent nihil took a shape, emerge as someone and redeem the world. Even she might learn what the mystic cipher held. This seeming exit or closed end of all could be a blind, tenebrous passage screened from sight, 
Her state, the eclipsing shell of a darkened sun on its secret way to the ineffable. Even now, her splendid being might flame back out of the silence and the nullity, a gleaming portion of the all-wonderful, a power of some all-affirming absolute, a shining mirror of the eternal truth, to show to the one in all its manifest face, to the souls of men their deep identity. Or she might wake into God's quietude beyond the cosmic day and cosmic night, and rest appeased in his white eternity. But this was now unreal or remote, or covered in the mystic, fathomless blank. In infinite nothingness was the ultimate sign, or else the real was the unknowable, a lonely absolute negated all. It effaced the ignorant world from its solitude and drowned the soul in its everlasting peace.